Hey, thanks for joining our online service here at Eden Worship Center. Uh, let's treat this time like it is sacred and set apart to the Lord. This is not meant to be a replacement for gathering with other brothers and sisters, uh, for fellowship, for encouragement. Sometimes we need correction. Uh, that's an important part of a Christian's life. But we're glad for this resource when you're not able to be with us, that you can be encouraged through God's word. So even though you're not in the room, would you just check in? Let us know that you're here. Uh, you can text that number on the screen. You can also text that number at any point and say, this is how we can be praying for you. Let, let us know what's going on in your life. So we're going to get started with the service here in just a couple minutes. But before we do, I want to ask you to do a couple things. Let's put away distractions. But this time can be focused upon the Lord. So go and grab your Bible. Have it in your hand. We believe it's God's word that does his work in his people. In a couple minutes, as the church sings together, join in. Sing like you're in the room. Pray like you're in the room. Dive into God's word like you're in the room. So take the next couple minutes, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to just prepare your heart, open your eyes and your ears uh, to hear the gospel, to hear the good news. That's our prayer for you, that you would hear the gospel, that Jesus might be exalted and that your heart and your life might be changed. church. Good morning. Welcome. We are glad that you are here to worship with us. Would you come on in, find your place, grab your bulletin, and let's stand together for the call to worship. Again, reading from the Heidelberg Catechism. I'll read the questions, and then as a congregation, let us respond together. Since then, faith alone makes us share in Christ and all his benefits. Where does this faith come from? From the Holy Spirit, who works it in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel, and it strengthens it by the use of the sacraments. So what are the sacraments? The sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals. They were instituted by God so that by their use he might the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. And this is the promise, that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, on the cross as the only grounds of our salvation. Yes, indeed, the Holy Spirit teaches us in the gospel and assures us by the sacraments that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. How many sacraments has Christ instituted in the new covenant? Two holy baptism, and holy supper. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you acknowledging the gift of the gospel to your people. Acknowledging the gift, O oh God, when you open our eyes to see the desperate and dark situation of our own heart. Lord, that apart from you, we are lost sinners, hopeless of saving ourselves. God, apart from you, we know the depths and desperation of sin that lurks within us, that wants to rise up, that wants to take control of us. And yet we acknowledge in faith that in Christ we have been made new creations, that the old has passed away and the new has come. And we rejoice then as brothers and sisters, whom you have added to your family, not because of our righteousness or our efforts, but Christ's finished work on our behalf. Lord, I pray that for my friends, my brothers and sisters who have gathered to exalt your name this morning. I pray that, God, for those who are here this morning and yet they have not made Christ their own. Oh, God, would you let that be their story? 
Would you open their eyes to see Jesus? And I pray that, God, for those who might be here this morning who are actually right in the middle of rejecting Christ, we beg you, God, open their eyes. For all of us, that we might see the risen and powerful Christ, the God who rules all things and by his blood alone has saved wicked men and women and made them saints. Oh Lord, let the truth of the gospel ring in our hearts as we sing. Let it ring in our hearts as we study your word. May Jesus be exalted in this place. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Man, I was so struck as we were singing those words together of the hardship that some of you have carried into this room. The difficulty, whether it is family or relational, financial. It it can be a whole bunch of things from our our health to just uh, your job difficulties that make it difficult to lift your eyes to Jesus. And yet that is the call of the scripture. That is the call of the spirit to us this morning. Fix your eyes. Not not just lift them for a moment on Sunday morning and then they, they fall back to your regular life. Fix your eyes on Jesus refuse to look away. Lean into him. Trust in him. Set your hope in him. Open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Is Roger around? I think he's going to read the scripture. There he is. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 17. So as Roger comes to read the scripture, would you stand together as we honor the word of the Lord together? Hebrews 12, starting in verse 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Let's pray. Father, you've told us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Help us to value holiness the way you do. Help us to diligently strive for holiness and help us to stand firm in times of trouble. Thank you for the example of those who've gone before us. Help us to live lives that will leave a rich heritage for those who will come after us. And now we ask that you give us eyes and ears and hearts to receive your word. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Hebrews, we are nearing and rapidly approaching the end of it. And as one seminary professor, Dr. Barnhouse, described this book of Hebrews... He said Hebrews was written to the Hebrews to tell the Hebrews that they were no longer to be Hebrews. It was written to exhort them to go all the way to Christ. So the context of these verses we're looking at today, and I I hope if you've spent five minutes in our church, that you have learned that context is the king of how we interpret Scripture. That what, are, what are the verses around it? What is the chapters around it? What is the book in which it is written? The context of this is an entire letter that has been saying Jesus is better than all of the other things that have come before. Good things and bad things that we put our hope in. Christ is better. Specifically, in, in the verses leading up to this, he's been talking about the discipline of the Lord as God brings hardship and adversity into our life. And he put it in in the analogy of running a race. Which is interesting because a few years ago, 
my wife and I went along with Chuck and Corrine Reed to Chicago as Chuck ran the Chicago Marathon, which is crazy in itself. But if you ever know a crazy person who wants to marathon, go with them because God has created wonderful things called subways that you can just hop on. And so we just chased him all around Chicago and we jumped on and off the subway and he ran like a fool down the street. I literally, we, we kept running into him at different parts in the city and I had a sign that said, don't die, Chuck. <laughs> I'm like, that's your one goal for today. Don't die. That, that's as far as we're aiming. Uh, he's still here. Uh, he got about 18, and I'd never heard of this before. He got about 18 what? How many miles? About 18 miles into a 26-mile run, and uh, his potassium level crashed. I didn't know that could happen. Sodium. Uh, and he stopped being able to feel his legs, and he kind of wobbled into an aid station, which they have all over, because why would you run that far? Like, it's literally based on a Greek thing where the guy ran that far and then died at the end. And we're like, we should make a sport out of this. <laughs> it's bizarre. Anyways, uh, so he wobbles into the aid station and collapses, which I thought, what a perfect picture of this passage that we're looking at. Into adversity, into hardship, into the race that God has called us to run. And he says, therefore, Lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet. We have all, even if you've never run a marathon, you've run the marathon of life and you have experienced the paralyzing effect of weakness and exhaustion and fear. Whether it is physically or emotionally or spiritually, when you feel like your tank is empty and I cannot go one more step. Remember, the whole context of this book is Jesus is better. And we just came through Hebrews chapter 11. All these heroes of the faith who have gone before, some in victory in this life and some in what looked like defeat in this life, in death and martyrdom, and yet victory in trusting Christ. And now the writer to the Hebrews, which it, it, we have said that all the way through because we don't know who actually wrote this book, but he starts sounding less like a preacher and more like a coach when we come to verse 12. Lift your hands. It, it, the race has been long, and one of the things runners tend to do in a long race is drop their hands. Lift your hands. Watch your stride. Be careful where you step. Stay on the path. I, I would just want to look at some of the words and phrases that are in here. In fact, more than we normally do, because they're incredibly interesting. That, that phrase, lift your drooping hands, hands. In, in different translations that you may have, we read from the English Standard Version, the ESV. Other translations say your feeble hands, your tired hands, your limp hands, your weak hands, hands that hang down. All of us instinctively know that feeling. So kids, I, I've got a video for you here. I want you to tell me, you, you don't understand this guy's words, he's not going to say anything to you, but I want you to tell me what this guy in this video is feeling. All right, let's go ahead and see if that'll roll. He's feeling like he's in darkness. <laughs> Try clicking back on the sermon and then back on the video, see if that... Take two. There he is. Oh, how's he feeling, kids? Shout it out at me. Sad. Good. What's another one? Tired. Archer, what do you got? Low on energy. Does he look like he's about to take off running or about to give up? Give up. We've all felt like that. Whether you're a kid or an adult, at some point we have felt like, I think this is the end of what I have in myself. I am almost ready to quit. You've been going. I, I love that line in that, that song we learned this morning. By the way, they, they just released that song this week, and I'm like, it is perfect for the passage that we're reading. We're learning it this week. But he described it as those, those verses that are often misappropriated in terrible modern worship songs where deep calls to deep, and it's some spiritual experience. No, the context of Psalm 42 is my life feels like it's drowning. I am underneath the waves, and from that deep place, I'm calling out to something deep within God. God, what on earth is going on? He's like, the, the waves are, are breaking against me. 
and it feels like it just goes on and on and on. You're barely holding on. And into that context, he says, lift your hands. Into that context, he says, strengthen your weak knees. That word weak there is a really interesting word in the Greek. It's only used five times in the New Testament. And by the way, this is the only one out of the five times where it isn't translated complete paralysis, which makes me think, I think it might mean complete paralysis. This is the same word you find in Luke chapter 5 when Jesus is preaching in a house and the frantic friends bring their paralyzed friend to them. The paralyzed man. It's the same Greek word. And they tear a hole in the roof and lower him down that he might come before Jesus. It's the same word that he says, strengthen your paralyzed legs. The legs, just like Chuck's, that no longer go anymore. They've come to a complete halt for whatever reason, whatever crash has happened in your life, spiritually, emotionally, physically, you're in that place of saying, I can't go on. And he says, go on in a strength that is not your own. Draw on a strength that belongs to Christ and not you. Why do we end up in that place? And I I think here's kind of an overly simplistic answer, but it happens. We believe in God. So we, we believe in his existence. If you ask almost anyone who lives in this area, do you believe in God? The vast majority will say yes. And in fact, they'll actually say yes to the right God. That they'll actually say yes to Jesus, except they more believe in some vague concept of his existence, maybe even a couple religious doctrines and teachings, but their hearts are bowing down to another God. Whether it is a God of self or something in this world, they are looking to something other than Jesus. Oh, Christian, hear me. How often do we look to something other than Jesus? And it drains our tank. The inevitable result of living with a divided heart is eventually complete loss of control. Please hear that one more time. The inevitable result. You know what the word inevitable means? It means there's no other way around it. There's no escape from it. It is going to happen of living with a divided heart. A love for God that we claim, and a love for the world that we live with our life, is eventually we will lose complete control. Here's what happens. If you hold on to your sin long enough, you will eventually find that your sin is holding on to you. You will be a captive to that sin. You will be a slave to that sin. Oh, if that is you this morning, if you've been living your life attempting to just manage that fine line of sin, believing yourself to be a follower of Christ and yet making excuses for either a secret sin or just a sin that's sort of out in the open that you just accept. The end of this passage has a dire warning for you in the life of Esau. We, we saw beautiful images all through chapter 11 of the heroes of the faith and then he picks one person out of that Old Testament lineage and says, but watch out. If you live with a divided heart, this could happen to you. If that's you, if you're in this room, I don't have to convince you you're living with a divided heart. You know it right now. You know the unfaithfulness because it pulls at you every moment of every day. And I would beg you, repent and turn to God. Repent and trust in Christ Ask him for saving faith. In fact, do it right now. Don't wait for the end of the service. Why do we think we have to wait till the end of the service as somebody uh, lowers the lights and we play just as I am and then you come to an altar call? No, come before the altar of heaven right now. Beg him to save you. Listen to this next phrase. Make straight paths for your feet. Stop putting obstacles in front of yourself. Christian, we have no power to save ourselves. Amen? All of our hard work and effort and good deeds cannot save us, but we can stop making it difficult to live a Christian life. 
Some of us habitually, through choices, continue to do things that just make it more difficult to live a faithful Christian life. It doesn't even have to be bad things. It can. It can be sinful things. It can also be good things. Things that are cluttering up your life. Potential tripping hazards. Temptations. Financial burdens. Things that create or aggravate relational issues. It's as if you quit your job because everyone there is mean to you, but then you complain that you don't have any money. You've, you've made it difficult. People are terrible everywhere. Get used to it. right? You live in a dark world. Be a light in the midst of it. But if you quit your job, don't complain that you don't have any money. Are you, are you tracking with me? Somebody's like, I just quit my job, but now I'm not telling them. Here's what Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says. Stop being conformed. Do not be conformed to this world, but instead be transformed with the renewal of your mind. If you want to know what God's will is for your life, allow Him to transform your heart and your mind rather than letting it be, as the message said, squeezed into the mold of this world. So he says, make straight paths for your feet. Remove the obstacles, but make straight paths. I love that word in the Greek for paths there. It's trochios. And it means, and if you live in this area, you're going to get it. It's the track left behind by the wheel of a cart. If you live in New York, maybe you don't get that. If you live in Topeka or Shipshawana, you know it because every year they have to come and resurface. Not the whole road, just that one little strip, right? Because there's a track that just gets worn into it, grooved into it. That's, that's the word. He says, make straight grooves, make straight paths in your life. Ruts. Now, normally we think about ruts and we, we, we think, oh, that's bad. You know, somebody's like, ah, oh, I'm really, I'm stuck in a rut. And everybody ever heard that phrase before? A, a rut is a developed pattern of thought or behavior. Now, come on, I just hammered you about quitting your job and complained about money. Listen to that one more time. A rut is a developed pattern of thought or behavior. No one else did this to you. No one else made you like this. You developed within yourself a pattern of thinking and acting, and now that has become the rut that shapes all of your decisions. It shapes where your life is going. It shapes where every conversation is going. This is fascinating language he uses because it's not going to be for another two millennia that they find out that's actually how your brain works. As you go through life, as you make choices, as you do things, as you say things, you're developing neural pathways within your mind. In fact, they've done things where they, they do cross-sections of cadavers. That's how they discovered it. Thank goodness they're not doing that on live people. Like, what are you thinking? Slice. That'd be awful. But on cadavers, they can actually do that and see within your brain uh, paths and tracks that you, through your choices, again and again, have carved into your brain and your soul, as it were. Catch this. Your pattern of thinking and speaking and acting are leaving a path, be it good or bad, for your future self. Your pattern of thinking speaking and acting are leaving a path, whether it's good or bad, for your future self. But it's Father's Day, so we should take that one step further, because that's actually the argument being made here in Hebrews 12. Your pattern of thinking, speaking, and acting are leaving a path, be it good or bad, for others, especially your children. I was uh, in Middlebury Saturday morning and I talked with a guy I'd never met my entire life not once in my entire life had I met this guy his name was Steve and I told him that my name was Gingrich and I said Gingrich you wouldn't be Harold's boy would you <laughs> yes you know what he said he said you sound just like him now Listen to me, moms and dads. There, there's some genetic things that go on where we have a predisposition to sort of look like our parents and maybe even sound like our parents. It's always a disturbing moment when you pick up the phone and you can't tell which is mom or daughter, right? It's even worse when the son is like 11 years old and you can't 
Anyways, but... <laughs> but you can hear patterns in the way people talk. You can hear patterns in the way people laugh, that, that within a family, they, they all kind of laugh the same. They, they all kind of sound the same. Why? Because we are leaving a path for everyone who will come after us, moms and dads. You are leaving a deep path of what it means to be a Christian or what it means to pretend to be a Christian. Oh, let us walk carefully. Here's the reason. Here's his argument here. Right now, it's weak. Right now, it's lame. It's limp. He says, don't let it become a permanent disability. Oh, but instead be healed. Look at verse 13. So that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. The word lame is interesting. We're going to land on that for just a little bit. It's actually the same word from 1 Kings 18.21 where the prophet of God is on the mountain calling the people who are worshiping the one true God and the idols of Baal to put their hope in the one true God. Now, some of you, when I say it's the same Greek word as is in that Old Testament passage, should have a little bit of an issue. Why? What, what language is the Old Testament written in? Hebrew, right? Not Greek. Except by the time Hebrews comes along, by the time Jesus comes along, they have what they call the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of all of the Old Testament scriptures. And in that Septuagint, the exact same Greek word is used here as is used there. As the prophet Elijah calls the divided people, here's what he says, 1 Kings 18.21, How long will you go limping? There it is between two different opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the people were so divided, they didn't have a word to answer. I remember a few years ago, being with uh, our brothers and sisters at New Life Fellowship just down the road on a Sunday evening, as they had some medical missionaries who were in speaking, talking about third world countries, what happens when somebody breaks an arm or breaks a leg? Because they don't have even some of the simple medical technologies that we have, even a relatively minor injury generally results in a lifelong loss of the use of that limb. A permanent crippling. That's actually what he warns against here, that that which is lame may not be forever out of joint, forever broken. So here's a question. Why do doctors hurt you? Doctors are terrible people. Like, you go to them with pain, what's the, what do they do? They, like, they push on it, right? They bend it in weird ways, and if they're really mean, they cut you open. And just this week, Danielle uh, was at work with McKay, and she cut her finger right through. Don't ask her to show it because it's, it's a specific finger. Anyways, she cut it <laughs> right through the knuckle and needed to have stitches. It was, like, gaping open. Do you know what this awful doctor did? He took a sharp like a miniature knife and just jabbed it into her. And then he, he pushed in a bunch of stuff that made it hurt worse. It was burning. But why do they do that? They do it because they're trying to heal you. Because giving a shot which hurts is actually more compassionate than just stitching it up. Right, bite on this. Right, are you with me? Like, I hate the shot and I want the shot. You, you tracking with me? Yet we look at God's work in our life, and we go, God, if you were good, if you loved me, you would have never brought this into my life. No good God would inflict that kind of pain on somebody else. They cause pain that you might be healed. God is a good Father who causes pain that you might be healed. Why is this hardship come to you, this testing, this discipline? Here's the answer, to make you faster. This entire uh, illustration is given uh, in this idea of a race that you're running. So why, why do runners beat their body, train their body, discipline their body, push it to the place of pain and exhaustion? And the answer is that they might get faster. Oh, imagine, anybody in here ever run a 5K before? Anybody in here want to run a 5K tomorrow? Is one, one hand. So here, here's what the rest of us do. Like, we like the idea of it, right? 
just not all the hard work and discipline that it takes to get there, which sounds really good with our world today that says, listen, we don't want you to feel that pain. Oh, how many parents have this approach towards raising their children? We don't want them to feel any pain. We just want you to be happy, enjoy a good life. None of this painful, hard training stuff. No, you, you just live your best life right now, and then when the race comes, you just go out there and you run your race. You know what's going to happen on race day? Nothing, really. Like, they'll, they'll run passionately for the first, like, 50 yards, and then it's panting and breathing and probably vomiting, and then a long time of walking, and then lost in the woods, like me, right? Remember that story. It would actually be unloving if a coach said, man, I just love you guys so much. I don't want you to go through any of the pain. Just take it easy. Play some video games. Sit on the couch and show up on Saturday. We're just going to see what happens, man. That would be awful, and yet how many people have that approach towards raising their children today? How many churches have that approach towards the members of the body of Christ today? No, God has brought this moment into your life to put his glory on display. This hardship, this trial, this testing that you might see him, might trust him, and might be strengthened. This is not to break you down It is that you might be healed. Only some of you are sitting here today going, well, not me. It's been tough. I feel like that guy who can't go on one more step. It hasn't worked for me. It hasn't strengthened me. It hasn't healed me. And I want to say something carefully here. Within the sovereignty of God, okay, God sovereignly rules all things, but within that, he has left that up to you to say, in the midst of this trial, how will you respond? Now, because he loves you, he will pursue you like a good father, but that might mean a lot of really painful, fruitless years as you run the wrong direction, as you literally run the wrong race. And so he says in verse 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Steve Lawson from Ligonier Ministries, commenting on this, said, do not fail to run the race on the right track. How often do Christians run, and I'm trying, I'm doing my best, only they're running on the wrong track. They're running the wrong race. In fact, he culminates that by saying, we actually have a great need for genuine conversion in the church. We have a lot of people who are filling churches today who have never been saved. They've just been raised in the church. And their hearts, their lives, their their attitudes reflect that. John MacArthur takes that a little bit further in saying, there are a lot of people who have an intellectual grasp of the doctrines of Scripture, but they really don't know anything about the practical life. They understand the doctrines of grace, but they don't experience the grace that those doctrines give. They've never learned how to implement them. It's one thing, for example, to believe Jesus Christ is Lord, it's quite another to surrender to his lordship and enjoy it. And my favorite part of this quote, it's one thing for me to believe God is omnipotent, which just means all-powerful, and yet in the midst of trial, to learn how to lean on his mighty arm. Oh, there's a lot of people who know and believe that God is sovereign and in control of all things, but in their struggles, refuse to lean upon his sovereign mighty arm so he says in verse 15 see to it that maybe your translation says be careful of that this is a really interesting greek word that i'm not super good at pronouncing uh, but is it is episcopo entes it's the same greek word that we get episcopal The bishop. So we have an entire denomination of churches that are based on a bishop model of church or overseer. That's the Greek word for overseer you find in your New Testament. So uh, it's the same word Peter uses in 1 Peter 5 2 when he says, I appeal to the elders among you. This is the call to watch over the church of God. I appeal to the elders among you, be shepherds of God's flock that is among you. Watch over them. That's that same word. Not out of compulsion, but because it's God's will. 
Hebrews 13, verse 17 says, our leaders will have to give an account that those who are entrusted with overseeing the body of Christ and you as individual members will have to give an account. We find that as well in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. There is a weight of responsibility that falls on the pastors and elders of a church. But that's not the context of Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 is not given to pastors and elders. It is given to you. And to you, he uses the exact same word in the context of the congregation, to the gathered saints, to what 94 times in the New Testament we hear one another, we are called to watch over one another. Not to babysit, be careful here, not to micromanage, but as much as it is in my power, I will see to it that you don't run the wrong race or miss the grace of God. That's the context here. One of another that we are to be in each other's lives, and sometimes that is awkward and uncomfortable. And we better do it, like we talked about in the adult Sunday school class this morning, speaking the truth in love. The whole thing wrapped and shaped around the gospel, God's saving power in their life and mine. And so he says, kids, this is your, your memory verse for the week. Run after peace with everyone. This doesn't mean make everyone happy. That, that's how our, word, our world defines that word peace with everyone. Just get along with everybody. Can't we all be friends? Can't we all just coexist and slap that bumper sticker on the back of our car? No, this isn't making people happy. Listen, Christian, the only peace that you have is peace with God, and then through the Holy Spirit, we have peace with one another. Sometimes that means loving encouragement, and sometimes that means confrontation for the sake of peace. Not avoiding confrontation for the sake of peace. And yet some would go, well, come on, like church stuff, is it really a big deal? The answer is yes, because the end of that verse says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's a huge deal. Well, I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Great, make them feel awesome all the way to hell. And then ask one of us to come preach at the funeral and then try and preach some. I, and I've, I've met with families in the past where they, they really want you to sort of preach them into heaven. No, our hope is in the power of a sovereign, saving God. And I'll just tell you what, as, as we continue to pray uh, for George and Carol and their family, for Kaya and Rory, we all go through hardships, but I take courage and hope in knowing that we, at least for a season of time, had a front row seat to God's sovereign saving work in Kyle's life. Did he struggle just like the rest of us? You bet. Is our hope based on our ability or God's power to save? Man, it's God's power to save. So Hebrews 3 verse 12 says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Oh, it will blind you and it will trick you. We need to hold fast to God and to one another. Verse 15, let's keep going here. So that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. Now, when we hear the, the word root of bitterness, we, we tend to immediately just think of like some old grumpy person. Or, or if you're into, I almost put the, the picture up from the internet of the, the grumpy cat. Have you seen that, right? And we just sort of think of that, you know, like get off my lawn type of approach to life. Only it's actually much worse than that. See, our attitude is just a symptom. It's a symptom of what's going on in our heart and our head. This is the only fill in the blank I gave you this week, uh, leaving room because I, I'm, I want you to tear out that last page, save the scriptures, and then write a prayer next to it. But here's the fill in the blank. My attitude is an expression of what I believe in my heart. What I believe in my heart will be expressed in my attitude. Again, it's not somebody else's fault. They didn't do this to you. It's because of what's going on in your own heart. It's because I want what I want that I do what I do. 
And so the writer of the Hebrews uses this phrase, root of bitterness, and he's not just talking about an old grumpy person. He's reaching all the way back into the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 16 and 19. It's way more insidious than just a grumpy attitude. Listen to these words. Verse 16, you know how we lived in the land of Egypt, and we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. You've seen their detestable things, their idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold, which were among them. Beware, lest there be among you a man or a woman or a clan or a tribe whose heart is turning away from the Lord. You hear how that's worse than just a bad attitude? A heart that is turning away from the Lord our God to serve other gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. That's, that's the phrase that the writer of the Hebrews reaches back, he plucks, and he puts here for the Hebrew readers who would have immediately identified this as someone turning away from the Lord. Not just having a bad attitude on a Thursday. This is someone who is turning away from the Lord. Verse 19 says, One who, when he hears the words of the sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. Oh, there is danger on that path. And I would ask you this morning, is that you? Is your life being lived as a divided soul? One between the kingdom of God and one in the stubbornness of your heart. Whether it is anger or bitterness or besetting sin that you refuse to deal with, hear the warning of God's word. Now, I want to be careful, all right? I don't want to make anyone doubt their salvation, okay? Are we clear on that? I want to make everyone doubt their salvation. Here's what I want you to do, just for a second. I want you to start with the assumption, I am not a genuine believer. Let's just start there. Here's something you're, you probably haven't heard that in church very often. How about this one? Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. By the way, the next book when we finish Hebrews is, uh, Lord willing, going to be the book of Revelation. Because I think a lot of people in this world have a really messed up idea of what is going in our world and what that means for the end times. And we're acting like the sky is falling rather than like Christ is king. So we're going to spend a long time pounding Christ is king, which is the one message of the book of Revelation, not watch out that you don't accidentally get the mark of the beast. Okay, anyways, stick around for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Here's what Revelation 12, you've never heard this in church before, I guarantee it. Revelation 12.10 says, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Here's what I want you to do this morning. Listen to his charges. Now, he's a liar and the father of lies. So I'm not telling you to believe the message of Satan. I'm saying he's going to bend your own sin and nature against you and then accuse you of unfaithfulness to God. And I want to say shut up and listen for just a second. Rather than making excuses for the way that we are, and then saying, I'm justified, I'm a Christian, because I've, I've come to church for all these years. No, what if you're not a Christian? What if you're, you're someone who grew up in the church, but you've never put your faith in Christ? It's always been in yourself or in your church. It's in your good works, me being better than the next person. What if you are actually outside of the kingdom of God? Listen to the charges, but then immediately I want you to look across the courtroom. That accuser is, is the image of an attorney who stands and accuses God's people before God himself. These people are unholy. These people are unworthy. They are undeserving of eternal life. But look across the courtroom because 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says there is an advocate. Again, that is the word for attorney who pleads your case before the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. Now listen to his evidence. So you're starting from the place of maybe I'm not a Christian, but now listen to the evidence of Christ, if it exists, of a changed heart. Oh, I once was this, but now I am this. Of a new mind, a new way of thinking about this world, a new desire for holiness, a new hatred for sin, 
a desire for unbroken fellowship? Or are you still in the old camp where every time your favorite sin comes out, you hide it and you bury it away and you say, I hope my brothers and sisters never find this. You're actually desiring broken fellowship because you love your sin more than you love God. Oh, hear the warning this morning. Listen to the evidence that your life bears. And here are the two responses that are left to us. Number one, either fall with confidence before the throne of God and beg for Christ's salvation. We can have confidence that Christ has fully paid the penalty for your sin. If you're an unbeliever in here or you have been on the fence for a long time, today's your day. Stop limping between two decisions and trust in Christ. Or two, for the believers who are here, stand with confidence, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, saying, agreeing along with Romans 8.34, <laughs> who's there to condemn us? If Christ Jesus is for us, he who died more than that, who was raised to life at the right hand of the God, if he's interceding for us, who, who can stand against us? Oh, there should be hope and strength for you, Christian. But if you have been wavering between two opinions, I want you to feel anything but hope this morning. I want you to feel desperation. Look at these last two verses. Verse 16, see to it. That's, that's the context. That's one another. That no one is sexually immoral or, that's an important word here, unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected and found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Let's look at both parts of this. Sexually immoral, it's the Greek word pornos. Uh, for all of those who say, well, well, the Bible doesn't speak specifically to the issues of today. Within the word pornos was every kind of sexual depravity. It was a general Greek word. So that included fornication. It would have included adultery, although that had its own word. It would have included homosexuality, although that also had its own word. This was a general umbrella term for all of it. And he says, within the body of Christ, see to it one another that no one falls into that trap. Uh, just for reference, I think these are in your bulletin, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 13. Where Paul writes and says, I'm telling you not to associate with someone who is sexually immoral. This is not the person who's wrestling against it, confessing of their sin, repenting of their sin, seeking to put it to death, but limping. No, this is the one who makes excuses for their sin and basically begins every conversation with God made me this way. Here's what he, what he says. I'm not telling you to disassociate with people who are sinners in the world, because to do that, you'd have to go outside of the world. I'm talking about the church. Verse 12, he says, for what do I have to do with judging outsiders, people outside the church? The implication is nothing. We live in a sinful world. Expect sinners to sin. There it is. Offer them the love and forgiveness of Christ. Then he goes on, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? What's the implied answer, church? Yes. We know that because verse 13, he says, God judges those outside. And then he points his arrow straight at the church and says, purge the evil person from among you. That's hard. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says, and this is why hard things are called for, that those people and everyone else who rejects the lordship and authority of the living God will not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, see to it, brothers and sisters. If you fear someone is running the wrong race, go to them as quick as possible. And then comes this strange example of Esau. We're going to hurry because we're almost out of time. It seems like out of nowhere. We, we've had all these examples of faith that we are to imitate, and then comes Esau. I'm not going to take much time to go into it, but this word or in between sexually immoral and unholy uh, tends to 
point us towards that Esau wasn't sexually immoral. He was unholy. He was rejecting God. But they're just for reference, you can look these up later. Genesis 26, 34, and 35. Uh, Esau actually marries two women. They were commanded to only marry within God's people. He marries two Hittites outside of that. And Genesis 26, 35 says, they made life bitter with Isaac and Rebekah. There is bitterness that comes when you are unequally yoked. Uh, same thing, go home and read it. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, we're not going to take time to read it, but it says that Solomon married all of these princesses from other nations, worshiping other gods, and as he grew old, they turned his heart away from the Lord. Now, let's think carefully as we wrap this up. God is sovereign over all things. So everything that we find in the Bible, we find again and again that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? You've heard that before? That was, that was by God's sovereign choosing... He said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. But think with me, it should have been, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Esau was the firstborn. That's where uh, the passing on of the blessing and the lineage should have come. In Genesis 25, again, we're not going to take time to read it. There's twins being born. They're, they're wrestling within the womb. And God speaks and says, uh, the older is going to serve the younger. God was choosing even before they were born. Uh, Genesis 25, we find the story of these two boys that are grown up. Esau, who is uh, red and hairy when he comes out, and so they name him uh, Harry Red, which is just an awesome nickname for a person, uh, comes in from working in the field. Now, how many of you have felt this before? He's like, I'm exhausted. All the energy, all the strength that I have, it is gone. Does that sound like the encouragement at the beginning to lift the drooping hands, to strengthen the weak knees? Only what does he do? He looks at his brother Jacob and he says, I would literally trade my birthright, my right of inheritance of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. I'll trade that. Literally, he looks at the stew and in the Hebrew he says, for the red stuff in there. Which is funny because he came out red and hairy and it says his nickname was Red. He traded it in the moment for some red stuff. Genesis 27, Jacob steals the blessing from his brother. You remember this story where his brother's out hunting, and so him and his mom come up with an idea. Uh, Jacob was smooth. I don't know what that means, but uh, Esau was hairy, and so they go and kill a goat and wrap his arms and his neck with goat hair so that when his blind dad touches him and feels hairy goat neck, he's like, yeah, it's my boy. Like, gross. How hairy was this guy? It's bizarre. And yet his whole life is a gross example of someone dominated by their own passions that are willing to trade the good of what God had for them for pleasure in the moment. Oh, listen to me as we wrap this up. You may feel like you have come to the end of your spiritual and emotional rope. You are weary in the race. You may feel ready to give up and quit I'm begging you, hear the call today. Look to Christ and keep going. Don't trade it for some momentary satisfaction. You are not alone. You're not the only one struggling with whatever you are struggling with. And you're not alone. There are others running alongside who desire to help you, who've actually been called by God to help you. So take heart, but above all, behold Christ the conquering king. You know why we feel like giving up? Because we feel like we have lost, the church has lost, even God has lost, and this world, to steal an idiom from the world, is going to hell in a handbasket. We are not waiting as a church for Christ to come and snatch his church out as a secret. In the middle of the night, we are waiting for the triumphant king of kings to come and sit upon the throne. Here's what I want you to do. Grab your bulletin. Get it out. On the last page, I stole a good portion of your note-taking section so that you could have these three verses. So uh, I want you to tear them out. Stick them on your mirror. Wherever you brush your teeth, wherever you comb your hair, whatever you do, uh, they're going up on Facebook. If you're watching the live stream, do a screen capture of that. I want you to have these verses Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. 2 Corinthians 4.16, so we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And here's what we know, Isaiah 40.31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Worship team, if you guys would come on up. And church, here's what I want to call you to. I want you to take these scriptures and put them up where you can see them and read them every single day this week, especially if you're one who came in dragging into this place, barely holding on. Be reminded of God's power and God's strength. Look to Jesus every single day. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, I would call you to put your trust in that God. Believe the gospel. Repent of your sin. If you are a Christian, but you've been wavering, limping between those two decisions, believe the gospel. Repent of your sin. Trust in Christ. And be reminded that you need brothers and sisters for that journey. So get connected. Be discipled. I'm not going to ask you how many use it. I'm just going to charge you to use it. Every single week we've been giving you family discussion and prayer, things to talk about. If you're a family with kids, please hear it as the gentle command of the Lord to discipline and disciple your children. Uh, do this. If you're a single person and you actually don't have kids, maybe, maybe you're a, a empty nesters like us, uh, this would be a great week to actually write down your responses to this, both children and adults. What is it in my life that makes me most exhausted and want to give up? What are the things that make you want to quit? Where are you relying on your own strength and not trusting in Christ? What is one thing I need to change this week to be more faithful. Start putting action steps to what you see and believe and then pray, repent of sin and self-reliance. Ask God for the Holy Spirit's strength, conviction, and wisdom to help you live a life that honors God. And here's what I'd like you to do on that same paper on your bulletin. I want you to write down a prayer in response to that. As you repent of sin and self-reliance, as you're asking God through the Holy Spirit to give you strength, conviction of sin, wisdom for the choices to come, write it down, put it up with those verses, and read not only those verses, but your prayer of repentance and trusting in Christ every single day this week. Man, I promise you, if you do that, it will have a significant impact on how you feel. There's a chance you could come in next week and your arms are no longer drooping. You're no longer limping, but trusting. Would you stand together with me as we close? I want us to do two things. One is to just take a moment before the Lord, confess our sin and repent of it. Trust in Christ. Again, don't wait till you leave this place to do that. Do it right now. And secondly, is a demonstration of that trust. That's what... Uh, giving in response to all that God has poured into us as we give back a portion of that to him in tithes and offerings. We're saying, God, my hope and my supply, my provision is in you and you alone. And as we sing this song again, you can bring, there's boxes at the front, at the back. If you're watching on the live stream, you can go to the website. But here's what I, I want your heart posture to be. God, even in the midst of things that feel like unending trouble, those are the times, if you're familiar with the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing his praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. When is it that God gives you streams of mercy? It is in the midst of trouble that feels like it is never ceasing, and God says, my grace is enough. Oh, friends, I know some of you are walking through difficult places. His grace is enough. His mercy is enough. It is never ceasing. And in the midst of your heartache, 
let it call for songs of loudest praise as you trust in him. Would you just close your eyes just for a second between you and God right now. Confess your self-reliance. Confess where you have trusted in other things. And right now, right in this place, say, God, I put all of my trust in you. All of my hope is Christ alone.